All right, hopefully, last lesson here on David. <clears throat> Say hopefully, not because I can't wait to get done with it, but because <laughs> hopefully I'll make it through the rest of this lesson. All right, last week we started on last lesson. Anybody remember what it was? <clears throat> the last key moment. Well, I mean of the ones we're discussing, uh, key moments in David's life. Yeah, David's lifelong commitment to pen and song. And we looked at 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1. Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, and goes on to give his last words. But the title there, he, he had this title, the sweet psalmist of Israel. And we said that he obtained that title by committing himself to what? Kind of broke down... Um, Couple things here. He committed himself to writing. Yeah, write. Yeah, uh, ironically, after I said last week that most songs, the words probably come first and the music comes later, then we sang the song on Sunday morning where Fanny Crosby says, Oh, that tune says this. And uh, But I still think that most songs, uh, the words are written probably before the music is. Uh, applied to them, but he committed himself to writing, and we said, uh, especially for children and as parents of children, we need to make sure that our kids understand that uh, writing is important. Uh, English is important. wasn't my favorite topic in school. Of course, I don't know that I really had a topic, favorite topic, besides lunch. <laughs> People used to ask me all the time, what's your favorite topic in school? It's like, I don't know. I don't like any of them. <laughs> I hate school. <laughs> I mean, I did all right in my topics usually, but I just, I didn't really have a favorite. Um, I disliked them all equally. I didn't discriminate. <laughs> but uh, writing is important. English, I know, guys, it's like, English. I heard a pastor say one time, um, there's a reason why men are good at math and women are good at English. And, you know, by and large, men like math more than English, and English, or women like English more than math. And he said, math is two plus two is four. Always. No exceptions. That's what it is. English is... I before E, except after C, and this exception and that exception. <laughs> it's like, can't make up my minds. But anyway, um, where was I? He committed himself to writing, English, uh, grammar, speech in college, uh, even high school. You know, sometimes I give speech. I, again, not my favorite topic, but important because words are the building block of uh, building blocks of sentences, and sentences are used to communicate, whether verbally or uh, written, in written form, whether book or, um, you know, the newspaper or whatever it is, these things are important, and communication is being lost in our culture. Um, even in texting, we don't spell out words anymore. U is the letter U, you know, and it, it's just... Another step in the dumbing down of our culture where we, we send, you know, emojis anymore and, and uh, instead of words. And, and words are important. And so David committed himself to writing. And we wouldn't have the Psalms if he had not. All right. <clears throat> Something that we don't take seriously uh, as we should, especially children. They don't understand the gravity of, of what they're learning. Um, even though we're told by our teachers how many times you're going to use this all your life, you're going to use this all your life. It's like, yeah, sure. And they're right, but it doesn't sink in how important it is at the time when you're learning it. 
But we said that Christ himself often told stories to communicate messages, uh, parables. All through uh, the New Testament, all through the Gospels, you see Christ telling stories to convey a message. Uh, he was a master storyteller. And you read through there, and he tells stories that convict people's souls. Uh, he tells stories that uh, teach lessons to his disciples. He tells stories, uh, true, some again, sometimes true stories, sometimes parables. Um, but he, he conveyed his message through well-spoken words, uh, sometimes, again, stories. So uh, David committed himself to writing. David committed, committed himself, secondly, to... Yes, learning a musical instrument. Um, he wouldn't be known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. He might be known as the great writer of Israel had he not given himself to music because there's more to music than words. So he gave himself to music, uh, learning this instrument. And which instrument did he learn? The harp. All right, the harp. He learned to play the harp probably, we assume, in um, you know, well, in his young years, and then probably practiced or uh, furthered his learning in the shepherd's in, in the shepherd in the sheepfold and fields of the sh whatever I'm trying to say there. Um, a song, like a song that we. Well, we sing uh, only a boy named David. He could play and sing. Um, yeah, that's not play like, you know, he could like do Lincoln Logs. Um, we're talking, he could play play the harp. Yeah. So he could, he could play. He could play well, and he had a reputation of that. And we said when Saul was troubled, he had the evil spirit from the Lord troubling him. Um, his servants recommended that, they bring in David, who had a reputation. It's amazing. You read read that description of David at such a young age, and he what he was known for. And uh, he he really was a special young man. He was known as a uh, a man of valor, uh, a soldier. Even before really he was going to war, you know, he's known as a um, oh I can't remember exactly how it's worded, but I think they say man of war, and. Uh, you know, he's known for playing uh, music and doing it well. And so he committed himself to a music, musical instrument. And we're told in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 18 through 20, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Not making rhythm in your heart to the flesh. Um but melody in your heart to the Lord is one of the problems with so much modern music, even you know, so-called Christian music, is uh, the emphasis is not where it should be. Uh, there's melody, there's harmony, there's rhythm, and so much as this, uh, you know, this backbeat is really just rock music. And there's a big one of the big differences between sacred music that honors God and worldly music that glorifies the flesh or appeals to the flesh as uh, there's an emphasis on the melody in sacred music and there's an emphasis on the rhythm in worldly or fleshly music and harmony is another issue but <clears throat> anyway here David uh, learns an instrument of melody you know the harp I mean I've never I've never seen anybody jam out on a harp <laughs> before. Um, I mean, I'm sure it probably can happen. Satan can, you know, defile anything. But, you know, most of the time, a harp is played. Pastor, uh-oh. Right. Hmm. Unreal. Wow. Wow. Right. Wow. Huh. That's sad. Yeah, I've uh I've I've never been to it. I've heard 
good things about it growing up. But yeah, I recently, I can't remember who, somebody said like music, they're rotten. But I haven't, I haven't personally been there. Hmm. We're using on what Sunday nights, um, uh, how to uh, or understanding the Bible for yourself. Uh, the author, Dr. Cloud, David Cloud, has been warning about music for, I mean, decades. I remember as um, just probably a grade schooler sitting listening to him, and he, at the time, you know, I didn't quite understand everything he was saying, but I remember specifically that he was talking about certain things that Pastor Kelly discusses. Uh, in in his music uh, teachings, and but Dr. Cloud years ago was warning of uh, music being the means by which churches will go the way of the world, basically, and not because how do I want to say this. We're never going to agree with the Catholics on doctrine. You know, we're, ne we're never going to link up with uh, the Lutherans based upon what we believe concerning Scripture. But if we can listen to the same music, and, you know, as long as someone claims to be a Christian author, or a Christian composer, then it's okay if the Baptists listen to them. I mean, it's not, but that's the mentality today. And it's okay if, you know, the, the Catholics can listen to that music and the Baptists can listen to that music. And, you know, yeah, you guys sing hymns uh, for the congregational, but the special music, you know, we'll bring in this new, this new thing, this new author, this new uh, composer, this new music. And the special music, a lot of times, is where this rotten music creeps into the church and gains a foothold. But uh, you see it. You see it all around where uh, the Majesty Music Hymn Book, um, the songbook that sits in people's pews, and I mean, not ours, but in churches, they have songs in there by, uh, oh, I can't remember the guy's first names, but uh, Getty and, what is it, Townend? Um, and these guys, they're, uh, and there's, there's others too, but they, they include them in the hymnal, and these guys are contemporary uh, musicians and some of them don't even claim to be saved or they're they're part of you know like again don't quote me on these exact men but there's others that are writing modern music that are used in fundamental Baptist churches that are uh, they're not even saved and it's just you see people drifting away one by one one by one church after church it's not a big issue anymore and again it's not I think, uh, like Pastor Kelly teaches, I mean, it's the Bible, but he, he likes to use the verse, uh, for lack of knowledge, my or my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, however it's worded. And where is that? Is that back at Hosea? Where is it? Where is it? Hosea. Um, it's just, there's not teaching on it anymore. And so it's not that, you know, everybody out there that's using this music is, you know, in outright, you know, rebellion against the Lord, and it's just people don't know any better, and it's dangerous because just because people don't know any better doesn't mean there's not 
you know, any danger there. It doesn't mean that music is amoral. And so we've got to make sure that uh, we are grounded in this area of music. And uh, Pastor Kelly uh, does an excellent job teaching these things, uh, bringing us back to it, it really is a deep topic, and people shy away from it because it's deep. But you've got to have something concrete to go back to, uh, some type of basis for godly music. Because if you don't, then your standard becomes the world. And just as long as we're not as bad as the world, then we're okay. Well, what happens when the world gets worse? Well, the church follows. Because we're, you know, if we just maintain this difference, you know, this gap between us, then that's okay. But, you know, the, the world moves further away from the Bible and the church just stays a few steps behind. Well, before you know it, the church is where the world was 30 years ago. And that's dangerous. Uh, so, and that's what's happened. That's what's happened. You, I mean, there is, you know, you listen to like uh, old rock songs, I mean, real rock songs. I mean, they're more mild than modern church music in so many places. Um, you know, you listen back from, you know, the early uh, part of the last century, you know, rock songs where things were just starting to transition and people started to turn away from sacred music and started to uh, reject the rules of, of properly structured music. And that stuff, that stuff sounds mild compared to our modern uh, you know, worship music. And so we've got to be careful uh, in the realm of music. It is so subtle, so deceptive. It's powerful, powerful music. And the world knows it. And somehow Christians don't get it. Or we choose to, you know, put it out of our minds. Like, it doesn't really matter. Um, the world knows exactly what their music's designed to do. But anyway, where are we here? <laughs> Get off track. I gotta hurry. All right. David committed himself to song. Okay, so he committed himself to writing, he committed himself to music, and then you put those two things together and you have songs. Okay, the writing of Psalms culminated in the marrying together of the words and music. He becomes the sweet psalmist of Israel. He had to work on these things and put them together. And as a result, a nation was given their songbook, the book of Psalms. Uh, this this wasn't just this isn't just something we read today. I can't remember. I was just reading, I think it was personal devotions, um, chronicles, somewhere. I, I should have looked it up. But they talk about uh, they sang the psalms of David and Asaph, the Israelites. And so this isn't just, you know, God gave these to David and they kind of lay dormant until we, uh, you know, comp compiled the Bible, you know, long after David. The, these, the Israelites were using these psalms, excuse me, as songs to sing to the Lord. All right. Uh, the, these psalms anointed David's dying words. Uh, he, he's just he's remembered for this. All right. His commitment to pen and song was sparked by his special relationship with God. All right. Uh, God gave David these words. It's, sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around. Um, how much of what happens in the world today is us and how much of it is God? Because there's responsibility on our part. If David would have never committed himself to learning music, to learning to write, to learning uh, the harp, we wouldn't have the Psalms. But at the same time, because he did those things, God used him in a special way to give us these, and he inspired David to write the things that he wrote. Uh, this was an overflow of his blessed relationship with God. Right. This again. I think I mentioned last week that uh, when reading on Spurgeon, the guy was just—I mean, he just took everything in. He read and read and read, and you know, gained as much knowledge and wisdom as he could. And then when he preached, it was just like an overflow. Like his cup was running over, and he just shared out of the abundance of his heart and uh, the abundance of knowledge that he had learned. And uh, David, I believe, the, these <clears throat> psalms are just an overflow of his walk with God, uh, an overflow of his relationship with the Lord. He was blessed uh, with special insight to the heart of God because um, he was a man after God's own heart. And again, we don't know what all that entails, but the Bible says it. And so uh, he, he's, he's, these, these psalms, his commitment to, the, to writing songs was sparked 
by his special relationship with God. Uh, another thing about it was that his songs um, were based upon events in his life. All right, these these songs flowed from the events of his life. Second, First uh, Samuel chapter twenty-two. For Samuel twenty-two. Verse 1, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, is this the right, am I reading the right place here? No, that's not. I wonder if this is supposed to be Second Samuel. Probably is. No, that's not it either. Yeah. Where is this? Let's see. Hmm. It's the right area. That's for sure. <laughs> mm. Anyway, somewhere. Oh, man. David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock, and him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. Wherever that is, if you find it, let me know. Where? One, two, two, one, three, three. Am I like, am I losing my brain here? First Samuel, that's 22, one through three. Second Samuel. Oh, I was looking 23, one through three. <laughs> okay. Woo. All that for that. Sorry, I thought I had checked 22, but I had checked 23. Okay. Second Samuel. <clears throat> David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, God of my rock, and him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. All right, so this is a song that uh, David writes concerning his life, all right? These psalms that he wrote uh, came out of his life, uh, out of the events of his life. And so many songs since, I mean, probably before, but definitely since this time, since David's time, have flowed from people's lives. So many songs who uh, have stood the test of time are based upon people's events in people's lives where God worked. And we have some examples of this. Uh, Fanny Crosby, all right? We'll read some, some just, just give you a little synopsis here of, of Fanny Crosby's life, all right? You read, look through our songbook, and you will find her name on many, many, many pages. <laughs> um, she was born March 24th, 1820, in southeast New York. She died uh, February 12th, 1915, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. She lived 94 years, 10 months, and 19 days. She said at one point in her life, Mother, if I had a choice, I would still choose to remain blind. For when I die, the first face I will ever see will be the face of my blessed Savior. Blind for all of her life, Fanny Crosby was the greatest hymn writer in the history of the Christian church. She later wrote, uh, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. We sing that song. She saw over 8,000 poems set to music. What did she have to know in order to write poems? How to write. What did she have to know to have them written to music? Music. All right. So when you're learning poetry in school, it wasn't my favorite thing to learn, especially all the poets. It's like, 
anyway, I can't get sidetracked here, but um, <clears throat> she had to learn these things. She had to know them. 8,000 poems that she saw set to music and over a million cop, no, I'm sorry, 100 million copies of her songs printed. As many as 200 different pen names, including Grace J. Francis, were given her works by hymn book publishers so the public wouldn't know she wrote so large a number of them. So the, these people compiling hymnals uh, gave her over 200 different pen names because they didn't want people thinking that this was just a song of Fanny, or a hymnal of Fanny Crosby songs. All right. She produced as many as seven hymn, hymn poems in one day. On several occasions, upon hearing an unfamiliar hymn, she would inquire about the author and find it out to be one of her own. <laughs> well, I guess if you're writing thousands and thousands of poems, yeah, I'd forget one or two as well. Fanny gave the Christian world songs such as A Shelter in the Time of Storm, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, Blessed Assurance, Close to Thee, He Hideth My Soul, I Am Thine, O Lord, Jesus is Calling, My Savior First of All, Near the Cross, Pass Me Not, Praise Him, Praise Him, Redeemed, Rescue the Perishing, Safe in the Arms of Jesus, Saved by Grace, Savior More Than Life to Me, Speed Away, Take the World But Give Me Jesus, Tell me the story of Jesus, the lights of home, thou mighty to save, though your sins be as scarlet. Tis the blessed hour of prayer, to God be the glory, to the work, will Jesus find us watching. And that's just a few. And we sing most of those songs. And she wrote every one of them. She was born in a one-story cottage. Her father, John, was never to be remembered by her, for he died in her twelfth month. For Fanny, When Fanny was six weeks old, she caught a slight cold in her eyes. <clears throat> The family physician was away, and another country doctor was called to treat her. He prescribed hot mustard poultices to be applied to her eyes, which destroyed her sight completely. It was later learned that the man was not qualified to practice medicine, but he had left town and was never heard of again. Fanny never felt any resentment against him, but believed it was permitted by the Lord to fulfill his plan for her life. A wise mother set about immediately to prepare her daughter for a happy life in spite of this great handicap. When but five years old, she was taken by her mother to consult the best eye specialist in the country, Dr. Valentine Mott. Neighbors and friends pooled money together in order to send her. The dreaded answer came, Poor child, I'm afraid you will never see again. Fanny did not think she was poor. It was not the loss of sight that bothered her young heart. It was the thought that she would never be able to get an education like other boys and girls. Surprisingly, at the age of eight, she wrote her first recorded poetry. Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How, ble how many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Eight years old, she wrote that. <laughs> Vocabulary, the uh, perspective on life <laughs> at eight, that she, she just says, I'm not going to be you know, upset. I'm not going to be, this is the Lord's uh, desire, design for my life. It's no wonder that the Lord used her to write songs like Face to Face. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But oh, the joy when I shall wake within the presence of the King, and I shall see him face to face, and tell the story saved by grace. And I shall see him face to face, and tell the story saved by grace. So, you read this girl's life, and it's like, wow, it's got to be so hard to be blind. And it is. I mean, I can't imagine not being able to enjoy the things that we enjoy just by seeing them. And she has this perspective that, oh, well, um, the Lord can use me anyway. And she, she applied herself to something, and God used her to write so many incredible songs that we sing today. Um, but she drew from her life events. Um, she 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 uh, she wrote uh, things that she experienced personally. Uh, just I think just like under a year old, right? Right, right. But it's still like I mean, yeah, you can't you can't 
entirely, you know, she didn't know what she was missing, which is probably a blessing. Um, but yeah, it's still got to be like difficult. You got to wonder like, what's it like? What's it like to see, you know, what's it like? Um, so you have Fanny Crosby, you have uh, Horatio Spafford, uh, who wrote um, uh, one of our very well-known songs, probably one of the uh, best known hymns in, in history. Uh, he was a wealthy Chicago lawyer with a thriving legal practice, a beautiful home, a wife, four daughters, and a son. He was also a devout Christian and faithful student of the scriptures. His circle, circle of friends included D.L. Moody, Ira Sankey, and various other well-known Christians of the day. At the very height of his financial and professional success, Horatio and his wife, Anna, suffered the tragic loss of their son. Shortly after, on October 8, 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed almost every real estate, real estate investment that Spafford had. In 1873, Spafford scheduled a boat trip to Europe in order to give his wife and daughters a much-needed vacation and time to recover from the tragedy. He also went to join Moody and Sankey on an evangelistic campaign in England. Spafford sent his wife and daughters ahead of him, while he remained in Chicago to take care of some unexpected last-minute business. Several days later, he received notice that his family's ship had encountered a collision. All four of his daughters drowned. Only his wife had survived. With a heavy heart, Spafford boarded a boat that would take him to his grieving Anna in England. It was on this trip that he penned those now famous words, When sorrows like sea billows roll, it is well, it is well with my soul. Unreal. For more than a century, the tragic story of one man has given hope to countless thousands who have lifted their voices to sing, It is well with my soul. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, loss of his son, loss of his business, loss of his four daughters. And after this, I think they had another one or two die. I can't remember. Uh, they had, I think they had nine children. I'm trying to remember. I think they had, don't quote me on this, but all but two of their children died. And I think they had either seven or nine. I can't remember exactly. But all but two of them uh, died. All right? Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin. You see, a spiritual focus, a heavenly focus through these difficult times uh, of people who, uh, the Christians who just determine that they're going to serve the Lord no matter what. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And a heavenly perspective. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. You think maybe he was looking forward to seeing his family again. I mean, we know he's looking forward to his Savior, um, but just these these people, you know, David and uh, Fanny Crosby, Horatio Spafford, so many of these stories, you know, we read these hymn stories. You have, um, oh, what's her name? It just escaped me. Um, there's others. I, I can't remember, but so many of these songs that we sing are drawn from life experiences, how the Lord worked in someone's life taught them something through a difficult time. David's commitment to pen and song became his greatest legacy. You know, we remember for David for a lot of things. Um, but when you read through Psalms, it's almost like it's this, uh, it's kind of like it, it, it trumps everything else that happened in his life. As far as the, you get a glimpse into the mind and the heart of David, uh, the, the spiritual nature of his life. And uh, we remember him for David and Goliath. We remember his sin with Bathsheba. Uh, we remember the things. But man, when you read the Psalms, it's like he loved the Lord. Uh, he was a man after God's own heart. 
3,000 years after their writing, when a minister stands to comfort a family at a funeral. Many times he will open the Bible and read words written by a shepherd boy and a king. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And, and you, you picture David, you know, I mean, we don't know exactly the time frame that he wrote every one of the Psalms. Um, but you just picture David sitting in the shepherd field, um, you know, probably pretty solitary, quiet, maybe the animals making some noise, but just pondering, pondering, dwelling on uh, the Lord, dwelling on uh, God's nature, dwelling on uh, their relationship. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And he's comparing his job to what the Lord does for him. You know, David wanted the best for his sheep, his father's sheep. You know, he's going to feed them. He's not going to let them starve. He's not a good shepherd if he does that. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Uh, a shepherd's rod and staff provides protection. It provides uh, direction. You know, they, they would grab that thing. And they say, you know, it had the hook on the top so they could grab that sheep around the neck and pull them back a little bit. Like, hey, come on this way. Because um, sheep are stupid, just like us. Uh, but the God's rod and staff comfort, comforted David. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's pretty amazing that we can read things like this, songs, poems, written by a shepherd boy 3,000 years ago. And today they still provide comfort. And of course we know that they're inspired. These are the Lord's words through David. But still, if he had not committed himself to writing, if he had not committed himself to music, we wouldn't have these things. It's amazing to write something that outlives you. You know, a book, a poem, a song, uh, a score of music, something that lives to bless generations to come. And God can use people today. You know, sometimes we get this idea that, uh, well, Fanny Crosby, you know, she lived in a different era, you know, and. Uh, Horatio Spafford, they were, you know, more spiritual back then. And, you know, they had some special mystical power, you know, God's calling on their life to write me. It's like, I mean, no doubt they let themselves be used of God. But, again, so many of these things were just written as an overflow of their walk with the Lord. And, and from the, uh, the um, happenings of their life, you know, comedians today, a lot of them, They'll write, or they'll, they'll write their script based upon things that they experienced in life and found humorous. Well, why can't Christians praise the Lord through things that uh, he's taught them through writing or through song or through poem, whatever it may be, and uh, be something that can be passed down to your children, your grandchildren, um, and uh, they can receive a blessing from it. So that's going to wrap up our series on uh, David. And we'll get into something new next week, but we'll go ahead and pray.